Um, do I have a pointer? Uh, you can use your uh, but and then I. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. Sounds good. Good morning. Uh, so uh, today I'm supposed to talk about uh, three-body final volume formalism for lattice QCD. I'm going to take the liberty to uh, talk also about. Uh, the two-body formalism for lattice QCD. This is a topic that is being mainly covered by Raul Bersanio at earlier in this workshop. But I think it's, a, it's an interesting formalism and gives some insight into uh, the challenges in the three-body sector. So I'm going to spend some time on uh, talking about that. But uh, before that, uh, let me give some um, motivation for why such a formalism is important for lattice QCD calculations. So in order to do so, uh, I need to introduce uh, some uh, recent developments in the field of lattice QCD for nuclear physics. So the idea is to try to uh, study nuclear phenomena from the underlying theory of uh, strong interactions, the interactions among quark and gluons. Uh, and uh, this is done uh, by using the numerical method of lattice QCD. Uh, um, so for, uh, for example, for uh, studying hadronic interactions and resonances, there's been uh, a lot of uh, good progress in this uh, direction in recent years. Uh, these numerical calculations are challenging, and as a result, uh, for example, the masses of the light quarks in these calculations uh, are not set at the physical values. Uh, they are uh, heavier than the physical values, and therefore, um, the calculations are um, manageable numerically in that way. Uh, however, um, even with this uh, heavier point masses, uh, it's, it, they are not trivial calculations. For example, for uh, studying resonances in QCD um, at a heavier point mass uh, of uh, 400 MeV by the JLab group, uh, you can see that basically in order to get some information about the masses and width of these resonances, you need to uh, map out the phase shift as a function of uh, energy, as you can see from here, um, to get this, uh, these numbers. So this is, for example, the rho resonance, which is the resonance in the pi pi i equals 1, uh, i equals spin equals 1, and uh, spin equals 1 channel. Uh, this, is, this is a very nice result and requires a lot of effort to, to get such a plot. So we're basically ready to, to, get, uh, to do this kind of uh, studies at the physical point, too. Uh, the other uh, developments are with regard to the spectrum of QCD. Um, so we still have, don't have a lot of information about the spectrum of QCD, especially when it comes to exotic and gluonic degrees of freedom of QCD. For example, there is this uh, upcoming uh, experimental effort at JLab, the GLUE ex experiment, that is going to uh, study extensively this uh, type of uh, mesonic and baryonic uh, degrees of freedom of QCD. So in order to get some insight, theoretical insight into uh, these uh, kind of uh, experiments, we have to have some uh, understanding of the spectrum from the first principle. So again, this is another nice calculation by JLab group, uh, as you can see from, from this paper. And uh, this is, for example, the spectrum of isoscalar and isovector uh, mesons of QCD with various quantum numbers. And as you can see, uh, there are some indications of the exotic degrees of freedom uh, here in this sector as well. Uh, I will come back to this plot later and we'll talk a little about the challenges uh, that we need to deal with when interpreting this uh, spectrum. Why are these uh, the reason these are called exotic is that if you think about the, just the simple quark model um, of QCD, 
Uh, there is no way to get such uh, quantum numbers just by quark, for example, quark and antiquark uh, degrees of freedom in a meson. So these are related to basically the gluonic degrees of freedom of QCD. So uh, you have to do the calculations non-perturbatively from first principle to be able to uh, deduce these energy levels. All right. Uh, Another nice result in the, in the past year or so um, is basically trying to get the spectrum of light nuclei and hypernuclei from first principle calculations. So uh, there's been uh, two collaborations. One is mainly a local collaboration and, and, and NPLQCD uh, that has done these calculations for both a nuclei and hypernuclei. Another similar calculations for nuclei uh, with these um, uh, quantum numbers have been done by Yamazaki et al, a, a Japanese collaboration. Uh, so basically, the interesting um, thing is that uh, you, can, you can basically study, uh, for example, up to four nucleons um, in this uh, spectrum and get the binding energy of these levels, the first few uh, energy levels of this uh, spectrum of these nuclei. This is a very exciting result because, um, I mean, a priori, it's not obvious how you can uh, start from quark and gluons and get an insight into um, what you observe uh, in nuclear physics in terms of bound states of nucleons. Uh, this is in a very quite heavy pion mass, 800 MeV, but this is a proof of principle that um, as soon as you have that enough computational resources, you can basically nail down the spectrum at the physical point as well. So are these <laughs> calculations um, are done in one run, so my question is you have two body, three body, and four body states there. Are they all from the same lattice simulation, or is it first two body, then three body? And uh, so uh, first of all, I, I have not been involved in these calculations. I'm just reporting uh, from MPQCD. <laughs> But the point is that uh, you create um, one set of gauge field configurations at a given volume. So there's been three different volumes. Uh, so there are three different configurations, different volumes. But then when you have those gauge field configurations, then you can uh, make uh, some interpolating operators for two body, three body, four body, and so on, and then get uh, some correlation functions and look at the time evolution of those correlation functions. So these are basically part of one calculations, you can say. So uh, as I said, this is very interesting. Even at on physical point, uh, you can get some insight on nuclear landscape and on physical pion masses, because otherwise there is no way to experimentally uh, deduce on such information about uh, um, the word at on physical values of uh, the parameters of the standard math model. Um, this is a direction that uh, the group by uh, Barney, Van Gogh, and collaborators are uh, taking. And we've seen a talk, uh, a nice talk in this workshop on this matter already. Uh, again, I will come back to this uh, um, type of a spectrum uh, here and talk about challenges. So, what I uh, just presented to you was some, some sort of uh, progress in the multi-particle calculations from lattice QCD in the nuclear sector. Uh, but uh, however, there are still challenges. So we are able to do these calculations if uh, we have enough computational resources. Basically, we can get more and more energy levels from these calculations. These are the output of a given lattice QCD calculations. So for example, if you are interested in four-body system helium-4, uh, then uh, this is a bounded state at 800 MeV. So then you might ask, uh, well, how about the scattering states, those that are above uh, the scattering threshold, like here? So then you have different possibilities. So um, these levels that I'm showing here, these are not based on uh, calculations. These are estimated from non-interacting energy levels of these different channels. But that gives you an idea of where to expect these energy levels to be located when you actually do the calculations. But the point of this uh, slide is that even if you can nail down this uh, spectrum, which is kind of dense and quite hard to basically disentangle these different levels, uh, 
you need to have some formalism to be able to interpret this spectrum. For example, um, the, the point is that these are energy levels of QCD in a finite volume and not infinite volume. So you cannot just take uh, this level and then say this is um, the spectrum of QCD in infinite volume because you know that you're going to have a continuum of states in the infinite volume physics. So you only have these energy levels and you're interested in interactions, for example. You want to know what the scattering parameters of your, for example, NNPP system is. So then how do you take these energy values and interpret that in terms of for example, hadronic interactions of infinite volume. This is a non-trivial question uh, for, for three-body and four-body systems. I have to see that, for example, if I look at helium-3 plus n, is that the yellow line don't agree with the red line? Uh, because these are at different volumes, so I forgot to mention that. So these are, again, the MPIQCD calculations of 800 MeV. As I said, these are not calculated, but these are estimated based on non-interacting levels. Uh, but these are for different volumes. So the point is that as you go to higher volumes, uh, the, you get more and more of these red levels. Basically, the volume, when the volume gets large, these levels get dense and denser. And when you hit the infinite volume limit, then you have a continuum of these states. But this is a feature of any finite volume calculations. You have these discrete energy levels. OK. So again, back to the spectrum plot of the Masonic sector that I just showed for 400 MeV. Uh, this is by JLAC group. Uh, again, as I said, there are challenges in interpreting these, these values. You might just take this value and say, that, well, this is, the, for example, the mass of 2 minus plus meson. But the point is that uh, most of these states are basically resonances. These are not isolated states of QCD Hamiltonian. What that means is that you need to have a, a model independent multi-couple channel analysis of all these different scattering channels, two body, three body, four body, and so on, that are near, for example, the, the threshold for, for this resonance or, or this resonance and so on. For example, the red line here is uh, the threshold for producing four pions. So for example, if you're sitting here, and you look at this energy level, then you need to know uh, what, um, how to relate um, the couple channel, uh, two body, three body, four body, and so on, basically every possible channel with the same quantum number as this state in order to extract the information about the mass and width of, for example, this given resonance. So this is a hard problem, and people are working on it. Yes? But I think the, I mean, the problem is actually harder than you're saying, right? problem that you're stating is actually not that well solved even in continuum QCD. Mm -hmm. If you're talking about taking a four body, taking data with a four body final state on this the is, this axis is and using it to extrapolate, to extract resonance properties, that is already... Exactly. So the, the, this is very similar to what you do to extract uh, resonances from experiments. So you look at different uh, scattering channels and um, you have to extract this information. Here, lattice QCD with this energy levels of finite volume are providing that input. And then you have to know that how to relate that input to, uh, for example, reson For example, for the row mesons that I showed, you need to know the pi pi scattering phase shifts. And in, in order to do that, you can do the experiment and get these phase shifts and then look at the energy dependence. Or you can uh, get these phase shifts from lattice QCD calculations, as is done now for two-body systems for, for this simple, um, not coupled channel uh, processes, uh, and extract information about rho. But as you we were saying, even for infinite volume physics, it's, it's, it's a really hard problem. So uh, what I'm just saying is that in order um, to uh, say successfully we understand this X spectrum, we need to know um, how to interpret it, these energy levels, uh, in terms of infinite volume physics. So I'm not going to go into the detail of this sort of couple channel processes. That's uh, another talk by itself. I've worked on that a little bit in terms of formalism. But um, I think uh, I'm going to address uh, more or less the, the challenges with uh, the three-body thresholds. 
because already we know how to do the two-body physics in a finite volume. Um, but most of these resonances sit above three-body, three-particle thresholds and so on. So we need to have that formalism in place as well to be able to take the next step and say, OK, now let's look at this spectrum and try to understand it. Yes. The scattering. Yes. Okay. That's the goal. But is it, but is it fair to say that, that to do that in this context is much more difficult than in the previous slide? Uh, I think so, yes. Like um, like orders of magnitude. Right? Exactly. Uh, well, th this one is, is a coupled uh, channel. For some of this, there, there are multiple channels that you need to um, solve at the same time and get information. But for, for the previous slide, um, I mean, for example, if you're interested in three-body force, as I would mention um, later in this talk, um, there is a well-defined procedure to uh, go around it. But um, let's just uh, forget about this challenging problem for now and um, uh, talk about the two-body sector in a finite volume. So. Uh, Lattice QCD calculations are done in final volume due to limited computational resources. They are uh, done also in a discretized space time. Um, but um, for the reasons, uh, for basically because I'm interested in infrared physics and not UV physics of this problem, I can just think about the continuum limit of these uh, lattice calculations. And the, inf the, the UV part, basically the discretization errors can be taken into account by other means. Here we are interested in understanding the uh, effect of the boundaries of the space-time on uh, the interactions uh, and energy levels of these two particles inside the volume. So there are some uh, QCD interactions or any kind of short-range interaction. It doesn't matter, really. Uh, these particles interact. And that's uh, because of the finite volume, I would have a discretized um, energies, then I want to take the infinite volume limit, or basically I want to know how the interaction parameters of this theory, uh, like scattering parameters and so on, uh, can be extracted from information from this uh, finite volume calculation. Uh, so when you have a finite volume, you need to determine your boundary conditions. Uh, the most commonly used boundary conditions in lattice calculations are periodic boundary conditions. That basically means that your non-interacting momentum of the particles would, uh, would be um, discretized um, in 2 pi over L. So if I look at, for example, the spectrum um, in the infinite volume, basically, if you have a bounded state, then you have an isolated state uh, here in the, in the real energy axis. In the finite volume, you're going to have that isolated states except that there are final volume corrections to it that you can actually calculate from this final volume formalism. However, uh, at the threshold of the scattering states, you have a continuum of the states, so that's basically a cut on the real axis. When you go to the finite volume, you're going to have these isolated poles or energy levels that are separated by uh, um, something of the order of 1 over the mass of the particle times L is squared. And therefore, if you take the L goes to infinity, this gets closer and closer, and you recover this cut on the real axis. All right, so you have these points. You can calculate the, this directly from a lattice QCD calculations. Uh, so um, why is that uh, taking the infinite volume limit non-trivial? Uh, the point is that when you do this numerical calculations of lattice QCD, you have to um, do the calculation in Euclidean spa uh, space time as opposed to Minkowski because you need to have a positive definite uh, weight for your probability density, basically. And um, due to the limited computational resources, you do this weak rotation to the Euclidean space time. So then what happens is that uh, there is a no-go theorem by Mayani and Testa basically stating that um, you cannot get the scattering amplitudes of infinite volume theory from Euclidean Gerens function in infinite volume. So that's the statement. So if you're in infinite volume physics and you want to extract 
uh, scattering parameters, you cannot do it from the Green's functions of Euclidean, except that at kinematic thresholds. So that's the only exception. So Euclidean just means imaginary time, right? Yes. That means time is weak rotated to the imaginary axis. Can you repeat the statement no group here? Again? Yes. So in infinite volume, you cannot get the scattering amplitudes from the Green's function, Euclidean Green's function. So there is no statement of final volume yet in this, this theorem, OK? So now, the way to get around this and be able to actually uh, make some use of this uh, final volume calculations basically is to, is to take that the final volume limit. And it's not actually a constraint or a limitation of the calculations that the calculations are done in the final volume. It's actually going to help uh, to get some information about the physics. Otherwise, we are limited by this no-go theorem. So this is uh, basically the idea of the Lucher formalism, which is developed um, to, uh, almost 20, more than 20 years ago by Martin Lucher. And I'm going to spend some time on giving a simple derivations of this uh, Lucher formalism uh, formula basically for, for 2 to 2 scattering. So there are uh, various different de derivations. I'm going to choose this derivation based on dimer formalism. However, as I said, this is the infrared physics. So no matter what interactions or what uh, uh, theory you choose for uh, describing your short-range interactions, you're going to end up with a universal result. And that's why this formalism is also useful in atomic physics for studying uh, atomic systems and so on. So Let's just uh, start by this uh, non-relativistic effective uh, field theory uh, Lagrangian, uh, where I have two bosons or two uh, scalar particles, uh, phi, or just say phi. This is the kinetic term for that phi field. Instead of writing the, my Lagrangian in terms of only the phi field uh, degrees of freedom, I choose uh, to work with this dimer, which basically sums up all 2 to 2 interactions uh, of the phi field inside it. So it's a convenient way to uh, study this uh, 2 to 2 interactions with this dimer field. This is nothing but a field redefinition. If in a path integral formalism, you choose to integrate out uh, this, uh, um, I guess this shouldn't be dagger. Uh, this is the dagger D, sorry about that. If you integrate out this D field, you're going to end up with a theory of just five fields that are interacting with uh, four phi interactions. However, that interaction in this theory is now given by D phi squared. So you have a dimer that would uh, split into two bosons and then gets back to itself and so on. These are type of interactions that you're dealing with. All right. There are two parameters in my uh, dimer Lagrangian, delta and G2. This is basically the strength of my contact to, to two interaction in this theory. Uh, however, I aim to replace these two parameters in favor of uh, the, the physical observables, for example, scattering length and effective range of the theory. So the way to do it uh, is basically just look at the full propagator of this dimer field. And by that, I mean you have the Bayer dimer, which comes from this kinetic term. And then you have also an infinite chain of this bubble diagrams. When a dimer field um, makes uh, this bubbles, it splits into two bosons, gets back to itself. And you can have an infinite number of these bubbles. So you just sum them up to all orders, and that's going to give you the, final, uh, the, the full dimer propagator in the infinite volume. Okay, so this is just infinite volume physics. All right, so when you do so, you get an expression in terms of G2 and delta. On the other hand, you know that if you uh, sandwich this dimer field between two uh, bosonic states, that's just this, the full uh, scattering amplitude, the 2 to 2 uh, scattering amplitude, right? And you know how to write the scattering amplitude and in terms of these parameters. You know the parameterization. Then you just uh, match those two equations. And therefore, you can write this um, dimer field in terms of uh, just r and delta. So q cotangent delta is going to be 
uh, the usual effective range expansion in terms of A and R. And Q is just the relative momentum of these two particles. All right. Uh, Yes, so this is just the residue of your default. So that's basically true. Okay. Uh, all right, so uh, now basically I have a condition. I haven't written those down, but you, ha you get a relation between G2 and delta in terms of A and R. Okay, so uh, now let's go back to the, to the finite volume physics. So in a finite volume, you basically, again, you can write down the full dimer propagator with the same set of diagrams. The only difference is going to be that when you have this loop, uh, loops here, uh, you have to, so in infinite volume physics, you have to integrate over all the momenta running into this loop. Here, as I said, you're dealing with periodic boundary conditions. The momenta are discretized. So in instead of an integral, you're going to have a sum. And that's the only difference. Okay? So if you're able to do the sums, then you can just write down your uh, finite volume propagator. An important observation here is that this sum, you can just replace it with the infinite volume value plus finite volume corrections that are power law. And we are interested in these power law corrections. Let me mention that there are two types of corrections uh, in this formalism, power law and exponential. Exponential corrections comes from those states that are off shell. By that, I mean if you start from an energy, the total energy of the system, um, and for example, if you have uh, that is below the particle threshold, three particle threshold, and then you have a particle create an annihilate here, for example, then uh, you don't have enough energy for three particles to go on shell in these intermediate states. Those are going to be exponential corrections in the in volume that are uh, small for sufficiently large volumes. However, um, you can have this S channel two to two diagrams here where you, you have enough energy to put both particle and shell simultaneously. And the reason they, they give you large volume corrections is that these are unshell states. They can feel, they can propagate to the boundaries and feel the boundaries. And uh, that's the reason for power law corrections. All right. So um, basically, as I said, you just do this uh, geometric sum, and you end up with this uh, result. Um, so Basically, you have delta and G2 in that expression. The thing is that from the infinite volume calculations, we already match those to the physical parameters. So we don't have to deal with these uh, basically parameters of this Lagrangian that I've chosen here. And that's the nice thing about this formalism. As I said, whatever uh, Lagrangian you, you take for your interactions, realistic Lagrangian, um, you're going to end up with eliminating those parameters in terms of physical observables. Your finite volume spectrum, which is given by the poles of this object when this, this propagator blows up, uh, are going to give you the finite volume spectrum. And that's independent of these parameters. That's just only now dependent on the scattering parameters of the finite volume physics. Do you want to interpret all the poles that way? Uh, what do you mean? This is for all the poles. Yes. This is for all the poles. Interesting. Okay. Yes. What is the superscript? It's a C subscript zero zero superscript what? Q. So and Q is that the, basically the total momentum of this object. And zero zero means uh, the S wave. So L equals zero, M equals zero of this object. And is that multiplied by Q squared plus I epsilon? No, this is, is a function this is a function. So uh, forget about these I epsilons. That's just technicality. This is a function of Q squared, which is the center of mass momentum of so you, any you of the particles. Su superscript that says it depends upon Q and also an argument. That is this is Q bar. Q bar oh. is the relative momentum of your two oh. particles. Q is the total momentum. Oh, sorry about that. Yeah, there are two type of dependences of the momenta. Anyway, this function is just a is, is just a sum. It's related to the Riemann zeta function, which is a well known sum, um, and I've given that here. But we don't have to worry about the details. And these are various extension of the Lucher formula for um, 
boosted systems when you have a Q in here, and uh, bounded states and so on. These are references if you're interested. You started with, a, you had Sorry. two parameter Lagrangian. Yes. You eliminated in favor of A and R. Yes. Could you just as well have done a one parameter and eliminate in favor of A? Could you Sure. I mean, the point is that um, this um, represents the interactions in your theory, right? right. So. Um, but you can have more complicated interactions. And is yes. So when we go to the, two? for example, when we go to the three-body physics, we need to in uh, introduce another parameter, and then you have to eliminate that in, fa in favor of uh, infinite volume parameter again. Mm -hmm. but so. But in two-body physics, you could also have additional parameters. So yes. Why did you choose only two? Um, for that? This is just a simple derivation. So, for example, you can work with what is called pineless EFD. So, you can put all the contact as well as uh, momentum dependent uh, vertices uh, for your interactions. So, you have a bunch of these uh, contacts. But again, you can eliminate those in, in favor of uh, scattering parameters. So, but that's just the procedure. Oh, so that's what you mean. Yeah. So the the physical that's poles that that, that okay. How many poles do you want to All right. So the deep the deep poles th those are not physicals. Those means that you don't have enough terms in your effective range expansion. Sure. No, it's more than that. It's the effective range expansion is only valid within a certain domain right. of elasticity, and those poles right. are outside that domain. Right. You can take as many terms. Exactly. As well, you, don't, you didn't have to introduce the effective range parameter. This is just for, um, right, I think, exactly. Right? Okay. This is just a function of how many. Exactly. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry about that. Yes. You should, you should uh, just be able to relate these, as I, I will mention later, to the, just the scattering amplitude. And then you can do whatever you want with your scattering, parameterize it for certain kinematic regions. Um, but so you mean that this is just for S waves, right? Yes. So the L there is really zero in the last line? Yes. Which L? Case uh, to the little L in the last line. Ah, okay. Kay. Oh, yes. <laughs> sure. Yes, this is zero. Sorry about that. that. Okay. <laughs> All right, so this formalism <laughs> that I introduced was just for a scalar particles. Um, we, we, uh, we have tried to generalize that for nucleon systems when you have spin and isospin degrees of freedom. Uh, it's going to look more complicated, but the idea is similar. For example, we are interested in studying deutron, which is basically an object with uh, SD mixing. Um, that means that um, basically um, in the two nucleon systems, you could have uh, four different channels if you assume isospin symmetry, where your proton and neutrons are the same, or having the same mass. Um, then you have four different channels for different two different parities and two different isospins. And uh, for example, the deutron is going to be an i equals zero one plus channel, and that mixes S wave and D wave. And from experiment, we know that basically the, S to the D to S ratio in the deutron wave function is this very small, tiny number, about 0.02. The question is that, can we get this result from QCD? How do they measure that experimentally? How do they measure that experimentally? Um, let me think about that. I don't know. It's not. It's factored from a phase shift analysis. And you take in any data at low energies. Right. Plotted as a function of energy. Um, right. The point is that you, you need to do this analytic continuation. So if you look at the scattering data, then um, you, you need to take this analytic continuation to get an this estimate one, of. This one is within the domain of validity. Of exactly. The right. Function. So this is safe. Right. OK, so uh, I'm not going to go into the details of the derivation. I just show you the final answer. And as I see, there is no mention of effective range and so on here. It's just the scattering, the inverse of the scattering amplitude of the two nucleon system. This is the final volume function. 
uh, that uh, I just showed you a simpler version, C00. There are a bunch of other factors and clutch Gordon coefficients due to the spin degrees of freedom. It's not really necessary to look at it, but it's just a function that depends on the volume and also depends on the energy levels of the finite volume. This is a determinant of a matrix, and that matrix is an infinite dimensional matrix in both angular momentum and total uh, J for, for these systems. Also, given that you don't have the rotational symmetry of the infinite volume physics anymore, then you're going to get uh, a limited number of uh, symmetries for your cubic calculation if you're in the rest frame, or for example, your tetragonal point group if you're uh, giving a boost in the z direction, and so on. So this is an important information when you try to actually uh, work with this quantization condition and implement it in practice. Uh, you better know the symmetries of your calculations to simplify that matrix equation. And uh, however, it is a still an infinite dimensional matrix. This would couple everything depending on the symmetry. If you have an S wave here, that's going to couple to the D wave because of this, this uh, function does not have the full symmetries of the infinite volume, and so on. So you have to somehow truncate that equation by neglecting a scatterings with L greater than uh, 3. That's what we chose to basically uh, simplify that matrix. And still, we had to deal with like matrices as big as 27 by 27. So yes. This is a this is a matrix, sure, but, that was but the that uh, the elements are in terms of the rest, the total angular moment. So in each each J sector, you're gonna have uh, different M J values and different L values. Oh yeah, sure. And because you don't have the rotational symmetry, so you, you, mm, uh, you can't assume. So you don't have the full rotations. For example, you only have a pi half rotation to take this to this value. So you cannot create a grid that conserves J. Yes, that's true. You lose some of the symmetries, and that's what comes out of, um, if you look at different uh, mm, symmetry elements of each of these groups and work out the relations, you can uh, deduce. Uh, um, basically, uh, those angular momentums that mix together under each of these symmetry groups. Anyway, so, and this is, as I said, the scattering amplitude. Now, it's not only S wave. Basically, it's, for example, for the neutron channel, it's S wave, D wave, and SD mixing elements here. And then also, as I said, you have some uh, infinite, uh, some finite volume induced mixing. So you have to worry about the J equals 2 D wave and J equals 3 D wave, and so, so this, on. This little L is the same as this capital L Yes, this is capital L. Yes. All right. So. Uh, um, I mean, it's the same. For any given a spin, um, then you choose your L. So in terms of partial waves, you know that um, uh, the D wave partial waves um, are uh, small, for example, if you look at the scattering data. And then beyond that, it's very small. So based on this physical input, we chose to, to work with this. But J and L in this context are the same. Depending on the spin, you have to deduce relations for J. If you restrict to L greater than 3, what J's are you restricting to? Sorry, um, sorry. if you restrict to L less than 4, which is Yes. What, what are the possible for example, for the Deutron, which is an, uh, a spin equals one channel, if you're restricting to only S wave, P wave, and D wave, um, basically the P wave is a uh, parity negative, so that doesn't couple um, in this equation. So you end up with only L equals zero and L equals two, right? And uh, so that's why you only have S wave and D wave. But then uh, because you have L equals two and S equal one, then you could have j equals 3 as well, right? And not beyond that. Anyway, so this is, this is just detail, just uh, saying that for 
the most general nucleon nucleon systems with uh, spin and isospin degrees of freedom, you can have um, all these different uh, quantization conditions that are now in simpler form than a 27 by 27 matrix. And then you can extract 16 different scattering parameters, phase shifts and mixing parameters in these four different parity and isospin channels so in principle. So I just want to make sure I yes. this right. So, so you're going to calculate delta GB on the lattice, and then from this condition, you're going to pull out information on yes. these scattering. Um, remember, delta GB and M both depends on momentum or energy. You're going to calculate these energies on the lattice. You input that, uh, that energy values in these equations. And so this is a known function. So if you know the input, you know that number. This is an unknown function at a given energy. So you choose some parameterization for your scattering amplitude. If you're below um, the T-channel cut, you can do scattering, uh, the effective range expansion, and so on. But anyway, at that energy, you know what the scattering amplitude is for that system. OK, uh, so how can you get that tiny number, the D to S ratio of the deuteron with this formalism? Uh, so we try to look at uh, the bounded state um, energy of uh, the system when at rest, p equals 0. Uh, this is how the energy of the deuteron would look like as a function of volume in uh, Fermi's. Uh, for a given irrep of your cubic symmetric calculations, that's just a detail. Uh, but as you can see, for, for example, eight Fermi boxes, you get a deuteron binding energy that is far away from the infinite volume deuteron binding energy, which is about minus 2.2. So this is the trend. However, we are interested in the mixing parameter. So a quantity that we can look at is uh, when you turn off the mixing parameter and look at the difference of the spectrum with and without the mixing parameter. And you get this. So here I'm using the input from the infinite volume physics. Uh, in reality, when you do lattice QCD calculations, you don't know the, the scattering parameters. The goal is to get those from energy levels. However, we know from experiment at the physical point uh, what um, some of these par scattering parameters look like. We can use them and get this expected spectrum from our formalism. So in future, when people do these calculations, they basically know uh, what they should basically expect from, from these calculations. So in principle, you do it the other way around. But this is just for investigating the spectrum. Uh, th there is no pine CFD. So I have this. <laughs> look, I have this equation, right? This one. Look, I have this equation. This one, I just take the ex uh, experimental values, right? Uh, which I have to analytically continue to the Dutron pole. That's true. But then this function, I know it for that given energy, right? I think I'm asking. Mm -hmm. No, it's not lattice data. So how did you generate that data? OK. So you take this uh, experimental values for NN scattering for this S wave, D wave, J equals 2, J equals 3, and so on, and also mixing parameters yes. for different energies. We did a fit to, to this uh, uh, phase shift as a, as a function of energy. And then we do an analytic continuation basically below the T-channel cut. So what form did you use? <sighs> We, we just fit uh, those data to polynomials for these channels. For S wave, we had to introduce an arc tangent. So it's just uh, some functions that would fit well our data. And then we just analytically continue. It's just a fitting to experimental data. It's nothing else. Anyway, the point I want to uh, mention here is that for these calculations for p equals 0 and p equals 1, 1, 1, uh, this shift is basically of the KEV level. There is no way one can get this information uh, from an upcoming lattice QCD calculation. This is, a, this is a very small shift. However, this is not the end of a story. Yes. So what's the difference between these two P points of 
point is I guess they get, should get the same answers. These two? Yes. Uh, yes, for, for this system, they would give uh, pretty much the same answer, uh, except that um, um, this is, uh, if you look back, these are two different symmetric groups, OK? So uh, the, this function would be a function of this total momentum. So in principle, the numerical value would be different. So that's why you get a positive shift and a negative shift here. But when you look at the epsilon dependence of those uh, things, uh, those are of the same order, KEV. So, um, but what I'm going to uh, mention here is that if you look at a different boost in the z direction, the story is different because then you have two different energy levels corresponding to two different orientations of your, uh, the deuteron in the final volume, basically the mj equals 0, a one-dimensional error of your calculation, and a linear combination of mj equals plus minus 1, which is a two-dimensional error. Then you get these two energy levels. And now, if you turn off the phase shift and do the, the analysis again in your formalism, you end up with these dotted curl curves, where the shift between these two is much smaller than the shift between these two with uh, epsilon. So basically, this big shift between these two uh, comes from, uh, mostly comes from um, epsilon. I'm not going to talk about the D wave. Uh, Neglection here, but however, as I said, uh, this shift is mainly due to the uh, non-zero epsilon parameter of the uh, of the deuteron, and it's about 50 percent of the infinite volume deuteron binding energy. So it's a, it's a it's a large number, and it gives you a hope that you can actually measure this quantity from upcoming lattice QSD calculations and extract deuteron. Um, uh, well, we've done that investigation, and it depends on what accuracy, uh, what precision for energy values you're considering. With 1% and 10% precision for extracting energy levels, we've looked at uh, epsilon extraction. So we've done uh, synthetic uh, data analysis, and we see that uh, with a very good precision and accuracy, we can determine epsilon. Uh, I can show you the plot afterwards. I'm worried that I don't have much time for the three-body physics, so I'm going to just uh, skip all these. These are wave functions of the deuteron in infinite volume. Uh, you can see the distortion of the wave function due to the boundaries, um, but that uh, still confirms that big shift for different boosts uh, of the deuteron in an infinite volume. I'm not going to talk about the twisted boundary conditions. This is another. Uh, interesting possibility for um, basically um, improving the volume dependence of the deuteron. If you're interested, please look at this paper. Um, I think this is, this is a nice observation. However, I'm going to just move to the uh, three-body sector maybe in the last 15 minutes. So uh, just talk about uh, the three-body formalism, uh, which is uh, quite more challenging and two-body formalism, as I would explain shortly. So uh, here what we do. Uh, basically, the goal is to uh, get the spectrum of the three particles in the final volume. I'm going to look at just the bosons. And then my 3 to 3 kernel is going to be at contact interactions of the dimer field with the particle. And then this type of exchange diagrams, where I have two contact, two body interactions with the exchange of a boson. I'm going to add them together, and that's going to make this three body kernel. Is your diamond dynamical? Does it have a kinetic energy term? Yes. The same dimer as I introduced before. OK. Uh, now, uh, let's just form the correlation functions of the three particles in a finite volume. That means that I. Uh, some, with some interpolating operators, I create a dimer field and a boson. I let it evolve in a final volume, and then I annihilate it with another um, interpolating operator of dimer boson system. And uh, at the first order, it's just this diagram. You propagate your dimer and your particle, and you annihilate it. <coughs> However, there's going to be an infinite series of diagrams where you have interactions among them. 
So it's just again uh, this nice geometric form that I can write here. Now, uh, these are again, the in, uh, instead of infinite volume integrals, these are sums over discretized momenta. So now coming back to my point uh, in the uh, two-body sector, uh, how do you get the power law corrections from this picture? That's when you have uh, intermediate on shell states with your energies. For example, this is when your dimer can go on shell and this is a finite volume dimer, and when your particle can go on shell. However, from this uh, K3, you have this exchange diagram. So you can basically put these three particles on shell as well. So if I look uh, closely to this diagram, uh, what I end up with is a coupled sum between Q1 and Q2 in a finite volume. Uh, Dimer propagator of these momenta, this is just detail, it doesn't matter. Another dimer propagator on the other side, I've already taken the, the energy or say P0 integral here, and that's why I only have the sum over momenta, the special momenta. Uh, and then I have this K3, and K3 explicitly is this object, that G3 term plus this propagator. Now we want to understand what the difference between this sum and this integral is. That's going to be power law corrections. As I said, you need to look at the unshell states. But those unshell states for this object is where this basically, this denominator is zero. That's where that, that thing blows up. Okay? So in principle, you should worry about these poles that comes from unshell states here. A very nice observation is that these poles actually canceling the, the zeros of this full dimer propagator, they're multiplying it. And that's very nice because then you don't have to worry about these poles in, take, in forming these power law corrections anymore. These are just the poles coming from these guys. And these poles, as I already mentioned, these are just the two-body Lucier poles. We've already calculated those. We know how to calculate those. So then uh, that's the key to say that now my, the quantization condition or the, the three-body Lucier equation for the system is now uh, two parts. The first part is where that dimer field goes on shell. And that means that I have the relative momentum of the two particles inside the dimer should satisfy this equation, which is the two-body Lucier that I already introduced. But then, however, you have the momentum of the spectator particle with respect to the dimer field, which is Q star. And that Q star is related to Q bar star, this quantity, through this equation. So if I have the E star, I need another condition, basically, to determine E star, because this, these are coupled. So I need another condition that would give me a um, relation for Q star. Uh, but before showing that re the second relation, uh, let me just mention what the implication of this is. Basically, now in the three-body sector, you are dealing with a system of couple, couple channel states. So kinematically, if you have enough energy uh, to basically, um, if you don't have enough energy to break up this, for example, the bound state of the three particle, you only have one Lucier pole from here, and that's just one equation. Uh, just, just one channel. But if you have enough energy to break up this one of these particles, that would be, for example, a bounded state boson channel. If you have more energy, you can have an, a scattering of states of two and one, and so on. So depending on the value of your energy, you could have a number of these channels coupled in your equations. And uh, these are just written down here. So that comes from how many Lucier poles are kinematically allowed in your formalism, given your energy. Uh, OK. The second equation, which is quite a uh, messy looking equation, but um, it's, it's, it's very, in terms of like, uh, notation, it's very similar to the two-body physics. There is an object here, which is basically the same delta GV as I introduced before, up to some normalization factors. And then this object, you might say this is the scattering amplitude of three particles. However, the complication is that this is not the scattering amplitude of the infinite volume physics. 
it is related to that quantity via this integral equation. So in principle, if you determine those energy eigenvalues from lattice calculations, you have to input in this equation, um, in this equation where your m is this coupled, and then just numerically solve it. This is, this is a very difficult problem to implement in practice, but that's the reality of the three particle systems. Uh, and as I said, it's a partial, uh, it's um, a matrix again in the partial wave, similar as before, but it's also a matrix in uh, those kinematic channels that I just introduced. So it's, it's highly coupled channel. Okay, so uh, a simple um, result that you can get from that uh, horrible rooking formula is where you have uh, a simple kinematics when you have basically, a, for example, a deuteron and nucleon. I haven't introduced a spin degrees of freedom, but imagine that these are just S wave scalar particles. Uh, and then in that limit, uh, you can uh, simplify that equation, that integral equation. So the reason is that in that limit, basically you have a deuteron, which is basically pretty much a compact object inside your volume up to exponential corrections due to the size of that object. Okay? So basically, you can replace that object that is not a scattering amplitude of the infinite volume theory with a scattering amplitude of the infinite volume theory up to exponential corrections uh, in the deuteron binding momentum that determines the, the size of this object. You can work out the detail, and you basically end up with the Lucier equation again. You're looking at the three-body system, but because it's effectively two plus one system, it's a Lucier equation, this part, plus those exponential corrections. So in principle, if you look at this problem um, and you want to extract the phase shift of the deuteron nucleon system, then uh, you need to extrapolate with some exponential form those, those phase shifts to the infinite volume because you have these corrections. This is consistent with the numerical investigation by uh, these people, basically Dean Lee and collaborators uh, of uh, lattice EFT calculations of deuteron nucleon scattering. Uh, so this is basically a formal proof for that observation that we give here. All right. Um, okay, so I'm not going to talk much about this part. It's just that the, the, the systematics of uh, the systematics of these determinations are going to be due to the, uh, again, the size of this object at the, the next to leading order, which is this one, and also the off-shell states. Because if you go beyond the, the deuteron breakup, then what happens is that you have another channel, right? So you have a coupled channel. As long as your energy is below the deuteron breakup or your bound state breakup, then that nearby state is just an off-shell state. That's going to give you the exponential corrections that hopefully are small compared to what you're accounting for. There are also partial wave mixing due to the finite volume of this object. We haven't explored that enough just as the two-body sector because uh, that equation is not um, easy to work with, but that's, that's just a plan for, for upcoming future. Also, you can uh, study the triton binding energy using that uh, formula. Um, just give the formula here, but it's, it's, it's very similar to the two-body physics when you study the deuteron binding energy. It's basically the same. All right, so as I said, for recombination and breakup processes, the problem gets quite hard because you have, for example, if you have energy to break up this particle, then you can have two different kinematic channels given by uh, this Q0 and Q1. And then uh, if you work at that equation, you end up with this coupled channel equation. You have the scattering amplitude, which is not basically the final volume of scattering amplitude. That's the problem. It's an integral equation of the boson dimer. And then three bosons uh, is related to the boson dimer, three boson transition amplitude through this equation. So it's just a formal equation. Uh, nobody has implemented it yet. But um, hopefully, uh, in future, we can, we can uh, spend more time on understanding this picture better. 
Anyway, let me also mention that there are alternative approaches to this problem. Uh, for example, a group of uh, people in the University of Washington, basically Steve Sharp and his student Maxwell Hansen, uh, are also looking at this problem. They've made quite good progress. Uh, it's basically similar. You take this correlation function, and then uh, because they are not using dimer formalism to sum up the two, two, two interactions, and they work with just the three fields, then they have all these sort of uh, different uh, contributions to the correlation functions. Then each of them has a different analytic structure. You have to find unshell states. Things are uh, highly coupled. And uh, basically, this is, this is the hard calculations. They're still working on it. There is a lattice processing on some preliminary result. But uh, there's going to be another publication soon on the final result for these calculations. That's relativistic and model independent formalism. Uh, again, they have a non algebraic form. They have integral equations and so on. So that's a general feature. But also. Can I ask the question? Yes. Would this non relativistically be just equivalent to what you do? Yes. Um, and basically, um, it's. Uh, that the relativistic and non-relativistic uh, is not a, a really big uh, uh, problem here. So uh, you, can, you can define your kinematics based on, uh, as I said, the Lucier equation is determined based on the on-shell states. So if you're in non-relativistic theory, then your on-shell state is determined with your non-relativistic kinematics. In relativistic, it's determined with relativistic kinematics. At the end of the day, there are some gamma factors uh, around, but it's not going to change much from the, your non-relativistic approach. But the so body scattering block they have, this would just be your dimer propagator. Exactly. Yes. Uh, we haven't been able to show the equivalence of our result, because we are still um, waiting for, for the final result of this group. So uh, it's good to understand better in terms of both formalism and, and get the same result. But uh, yeah, we should work on that for sure. The nice thing about this approach is that uh, They've been able to reproduce the perturbative result of uh, multi meson interactions that are done by uh, Silas Bean, Martin Savage, and Will Dapmold, and also by Shina Tan, up to order 1 over L to the 6. So if you take the interactions very, the very weak and just uh, expand, they basically recover this result. So that's nice. I'm going to also mention the work by uh, Hans and his student, Simon Kruser where um, in a couple of papers, they've tried to look at the FMO physics in a finite volume, uh, and also to the triton binding energy uh, dependence on the volume. Uh, so basically, the idea is similar. You have this uh, scattering amplitude, which is this kernel plus this uh, integral equation, basically. Then you solve it in, in, uh, in terms of a sum equation in, 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 in the finite volume. Uh, so what these guys have done is to try to uh, input and uh, parameters of the EFT and then drive the uh, energy eigenvalues of the final volume physics and then plot that as a function of volume. So mm, it's not a direct uh, relation between the scattering amplitudes of the infinite volume physics and a scattering parameter, but these are also very nice uh, 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 efforts in these directions if you're interested. Uh, we are seeing some inconsistency in terms of the formalism with uh, these papers, but I, I'd like to uh, talk to you about those. Uh, but um, I think we, we got the uh, picture and th th this, this uh, formalism for the dimer from, from these papers that were very helpful. Uh, anyway, so just uh, the last thing I want to say is that uh, I showed you a very complicated formalism for a three-body system. In principle, there are simple ways to approach this problem. For example, you can just take uh, a well-defined EFT for your three-body and two-body force, for example, the contact interactions. Then you can take the lattice QCD input for, for example, two-body and three-body system and fit those uh, low energy coefficients of the, the uh, effective field theory, you don't have to think about the scattering amplitudes. Just uh, fit those coefficients, and then you can make predictions for four body, five body, and so on. This is basically the direction uh, taken by these guys, um, near Birna and uh, collaborators. 
as you can see, they took uh, NPL QCD data at 800 MeV, and they fit their low energy coefficients of the effective field theory, and they could produce within uncertainties the helium-4 uh, binding energy, but also they have predictions for uh, heavier nuclei that can be tested by lattice QCD calculations uh, for these systems. So uh, basically, this is the idea of how lattice QCD can be in eventually useful in uh, trying to build up the nuclear landscape. Lattice QCD is not going to be able to um, uh, determine the whole uh, landscape of nuclear physics, but only for the first few uh, nuclei. If you're able to constrain the force parameters and so on in the sector, then you can match those to uh, the man nuclear many-body calculations for low mass and medium mass region, and then to heavier nuclei. And that's where you can systematically build up this nuclear landscape based on QCD input which is very uh, important uh, direction. Anyway, so the summary, uh, I hope I convinced you that the progress in multiparticle calculations have been uh, significant uh, in the, the nuclear sector in recent years. Uh, final volume for Madison for studying two-body systems uh, have been developed and investigated well enough, so uh, that's good. Uh, for three-body system, it's still under development and it doesn't have the same level of maturity as two-body sector, but this is a direction that various people and groups have been taking to, to nail down this problem. Uh, as I said, lattice QCD with the help of effective field theories would be eventually able to address uh, interesting problems in nuclear physics, hopefully in the upcoming years. Thank you very much. nuclear structure people, they do their calculations anyway in a finite volume. Right. And so, so really, you can just do the lattice QCD calculations that give you the energy levels, and then you just give the energy levels to whoever's doing the model building on the continuum side. I think eventually that's what uh, people should do, because, uh, I mean, it doesn't, it, the, the nice thing about the, having a formalism is that it's, it's just model independent. It's, it's just, it has the beauties so of Blucher, but, uh, yeah, sure. Yeah, I mean, um, the field theory, you, you just do the calculation in a finite volume, and it gives you energy levels. Right. And you just fix those energy levels to the lattice. Right. That's what he did. That's what we did in that paper that nobody reads. But <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 read, I read it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, that's, it, that's true. So but that's, what, that's what they did for three right. bodies, right? Was the, the right, 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 right. Like yeah, you yeah. take your yeah. EFT calculation, you latticize it, and then you say, well, this is so yeah. this should be the point of comparison. But in the context that you asked, it's, it's even more the case, right? When you're doing like annihilation, or oh, you're yeah, doing yeah, yeah. You know, meson, meson <coughs> or whatever, because there you have no EFT. Exactly, right. So you may as well just take a model and put that model in a finite volume. Yeah, I think from the practical point of view, you're right. I mean, uh, I had much more hope um, before starting working on it, but now given that, uh, I mean, different people are basically given um, get similar um, complicated formalism for, for this that is pr pr particularly hard to implement given the few lattice QCD input, it might not be the optimal way to go in future. So I agree with you. So um, I have a question sure. so that I understand what's been accomplished in the three-body sector. So if I take the Lucia formula in the two-body sector, I can take the phase shift Mm -hmm. So can I give you a three-body parameter, and you can plot the three-body energies as a function of the two-body phase shift? Yes, we can, we can in principle do it, but we haven't done it. So what does in principle mean? That means that we have the formalism here. And how hard is it to get a graph out of the formalism, I guess is what I'm asking. Uh, well, uh, we haven't invested enough on that, so I can't tell you if that's hard uh, uh, necessarily. 
but uh, it's, it's much harder than two-body physics. So basically, um, you're going to give me uh, some input for, it, uh, for this object here, which is the infinite volume and scattering amplitude. But mm -hmm. uh, you're going to give me that object as a function of momentum. Okay? And then, so that's not just one single value. I need a range of these uh, uh, numbers here. But then I know what this uh, object is. I know uh, what the, this, basically then this, this is an integral equation. That means that uh, I have to do some numerical uh, calculations to um, get the energies. Well, it, it's basically hard. I guess the other way around, it might be simpler if you have energies and try to get the scattering amplitudes. But yes. Um, the bounds for the bound energy levels, that's what we've done. We, we've solved essentially yes. the time EFT and a finite volume, so it fits in terms of these parameters. It's just that we, we do not have the, the energy levels uh, that are correspond to scattering space. Right. We can do this much easier. Yes. Numerically, we can do this much easier because it's just a simple loser with some exponential form. But yes, for the general uh, three body scattering amplitude, uh, Mm, no, there's not been enough work, numerical work in that direction. Yes. Sure. I, I have a question. Yes. Sorry, I have one other question. Yes. Um, so, uh, what is the can you show the exponentially suppressed three body slide that you have mine and a square root four thirds Q1 star square? Yes. I think it's like a couple of slides on. There we are. Okay. Yeah. So, I was trying, I, I want to make sure I understand the point here, right? So. What happens to this if you arrange your incoming diboson boson state so you're at an E star above the three body threshold? Mm -hmm. So then this turns into power law. So the idea is that uh, you have an object uh, as a function of momentum. You're uh, doing a sum of that sum and as a function of momentum. And then that sum and if that's a nice smooth function with no singularities, you can replace that function with the infinite volume value, basically, up to exponential corrections that the Poisson resummation formula. However, if that sum blows up, which means that your particle can go on shell, your propagators can go on shell, then uh, you get the infinite volume value plus corrections that are power law because you have these on shell power law states. So then this term turn into power law corrections. And the way to account for this uh, is going to be this equation. So this, so this <coughs> issue is not killed by the zeros in the dimer propagator? No, no, that's not. You still have the dimer propagator poles. Those are not canceled by anything. The, the pole, yes. Poles Oh, the dimer propagator. Yes. Yeah. So if you come back to. So you don't have. The, uh, you have the poles from these two th uh, objects. Yeah. You don't have the poles from this because they cancel with the zeros of this so object. So somehow the poles coming from three particles where one of them is exchanged get canceled. Yes. The poles coming from a dimer splitting up and re yes. and then a three body cut there are yes. still present. Yes. Okay. Other question? Not to let's thank the speaker again. So we we'll have an informal discussion in the afternoon at the three table. About uh, three body problems. Can I turn you off? Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, so, oh, okay. Cool. Sure.